Well, I've, I've been privileged to spend the last few days uh, with another one of our international guests, uh, Robert Scoble. Robert lives in Half Moon Bay, California, on the doorstep of Silicon Valley. Uh, and uh, it's been fantastic getting to know Robert over the last few years. He travels the world looking for what's happening on the bleeding edge of technology. He's interviewed thousands of technology executives around the world and shares his insights through his incredible newsletter, Life and Tech, a weekly email which I highly encourage you to, uh, to subscribe to, and of course millions of followers through social media channels. All the way from Silicon Valley, brought to you by Telstra, welcome to the stage, Robert the Scobalizer, Scoble. Thank you. Um, I have a very unusual role in corporate world. I get to go around the world and meet cool, innovative startups. I met one outside uh, just a few minutes ago. And um, I put that learning into public. I'm a public face of a public company, which is a sometimes stressful role as I was backstage arguing with my boss about something. <laughs> Innovation is not easy, and uh, uh, changing the world is not easy. But this is my, uh, uh, is my findings from around the world and, and, and the new world that we're heading into. We're heading into an era where we're going to see the mobile screen devalued. Today, we, we stare at that screen for hours every day, at least I do. But soon, we're going to be getting devices and interfaces to our world that are going to take some of our attention or a lot of our attention off of that mobile screen and put it elsewhere. This is the uh, founder of Meta in uh, Silicon Valley. He uh, built uh, glasses for jet fighters in the Israeli military and now he's bringing those to the public. And he's not alone. You might have seen Microsoft HoloLens or heard of a company called Magic Leap. Back Let's talk about Magic Leap. How many people have heard of Magic Leap? Just a few. Google invested half a billion dollars in this company that nobody knows about. And Baidu is about to announce another half a billion dollar investment uh, in the next few days. What is it? It's a glass that you look through and you see an augmented item on top of the real world, properly occluded as it goes underneath a real desk. It is a highly uh, contrasty image. Ted Shilowitz, I visited his labs at 20th Century Fox, the movie company. He said this is Google's first trillion dollar idea. Why would a guy like that say this is a trillion dollar idea? because we're gonna entertain ourselves by saying, I'd like to play chess on this table, and a chessboard will appear on the table, and then we can play virtual chess right there. Or we're gonna be able to see new kinds of entertainment on demand. Or, if I'm just walking around the city that I don't really know that well, it's gonna tell me about the city and what I'm looking at. And you might think that's all science fiction, it's years away. But if you come and visit our uh, football stadium, Levi Stadium, where the Super Bowl is going to be held in February, a lot of this is already happening and the bl building blocks for this new world where you're going to walk around and the, wor the world will tell you things and do things for you as you walk around is already set in place in a sporting stadium. This stadium has 2,000 beacons in it. You probably don't even know what a beacon is. I'll explain what it is in a second. It has 1,200 Wi-Fi hotspots. It has 40 gigabits of Ethernet in and out. And thanks to the mobile revolution, when you buy a ticket for the Super Bowl, it knows where you bought it. At home, in your business. It knows when you entered the parking lot with your car. And in fact, before you got there, let's say uh, El Nino closes parking lot A due to flooding he can renegotiate re with you on your mobile phone to go to parking lot C, because that's where your open spots are. The guy who runs the stadium, this guy, can sit in front of four screens and see literally everything about everything about you and the stadium. When you walk into the stadium, you're gonna walk by one of these devices. It's a Keyzar, they call it, but it's an Internet of Things device that has several radios seeing you walk by it. 
as you walk in the front of the stadium, up on a 4K screen, your name is going to appear. That should uh, freak you out a little bit. Because uh, how did your name get up on the screen as you walk into the stadium? Now, you've approved that, but most people are going to find that extraordinarily cool. They're going to turn around and take a selfie of their name up on the screen and show all their friends on Facebook that they have Super Bowl tickets, right? This also gets you entrance to all the clubs, and if you don't have a pass that gets you into one of the clubs, it turns red, so the security guard goes, hey. <laughs> now, when I give this talk, somebody usually mouths off and says, I'm gonna turn that shit off. I'm gonna turn off the Bluetooth radio so that it can't do that and doesn't follow me around. Because with 2,000 beacons, let's talk about beacons, these little radios, they cost about $10 each, maybe less if you buy a bunch of them like they did. Um, it spits three numbers into the air every 30th of a second. And your phone can tell how close it is to one of those. So if we had five of these beacons around us, it would know exactly where we are sitting, right? Just even better than GPS outside. So with 2,000 beacons, he knows exactly where you are in the stadium. People say, I'm going to turn this off. No, you're not. Because if you turn it off, you can't have food delivered to your seat. And somebody last night told me that they're using this kind of system in stadiums, and they're not going to let you in the stadium. And he knows where the lines, he has a sensor on the bathrooms to know how long the line is in the bathroom. And he's going to be able to, on your mobile phone, say, where's the closest bathroom? And it's going to navigate you to the bathroom with the shortest line, right? And on his four screens, he can see how many hot dogs are selling per minute, which, which uh, hot dog vendor is being overloaded, so he can tell, re redistribute resources, and, and more and more. You should know about this guy, uh, Daniel Almog. His dad started Zoran, famous electronic manufacturer. He started a new app called Topingo, a system really, because it's more than an app. This app lets you, and it's for college kids right now, that's why you haven't heard about it, but if you're a college kid in uh, uh, universities in Santa Clara, uh, Santa Clara University, for instance, 70% uh, of all transactions are already going through his system. This guy is going to be a trillionaire if somebody doesn't stop him. His app, when you <clears throat> pull it out at 7 in the morning in bed and you want an ice latte, it says your ice latte will be ready at this Starbucks at 7.29 a.m. You go in and pick up that latte and you leave. You don't talk to anybody, you don't touch anything, you don't hand over any cash. It's like Uber. But that was last year. This year, he said, well, I know where every customer is in real time. So if you're going to school with me, and you're in the class next door to me, and you're in the Starbucks, your phone will go notify, take, pick up this drink and bring it to class and bring it to Scoble's class and deliver it. And you'll get 10 Topingo dollars or something like that. So he's building a peer-to-peer -peer delivery network that's gonna deliver anything to anybody. And he's building a virtual currency that's gonna keep us from having to put money into Visa, which costs 2% every time you put money in and out of the bank, right? So. He's thinking of a world where you're going to walk around with one of these glasses and talk to it and say, I want a hot dog delivered to me. And in two minutes, a hot dog will come. This is already happening in uh, businesses in Silicon Valley. Um, this, uh, this thing, if you go to Koopa Cafe in Palo Alto, which is one of the famous, coolest places to go for meeting venture capitalists, they take Bitcoin at this cafe. It's pretty... They had a robot making tea, a lot of fun stuff there. But this thing, when you, uh, the old way of ordering at that restaurant was you had to go in line, uh, you know, order a, uh, 
a latte and uh, uh, wait 20 minutes in line and, and then wait for your latte. So, you know, it, it, Monty, if, if I had an hour of your time in Palo Alto, California, when you come and visit, and I get up and wait in line for 20 minutes, that's pretty stupid, right? So now I pull out my app, my downtown app, and I say I want two lattes delivered to the table. And in two minutes, they just show up. And I don't pay, I don't I pull out a credit card, I don't tap anything. Yeah, you know, it's sort of like that. It's sort of like the first line service, right? And they put this thing in, and sales went up 35%. So I know you're going to do it, too, in your communities. Because you're not stupid. You want to maximize profits. We have a new app called House Call. This is a big app in San Diego, California, which is where it started. A couple guys left Qualcomm. Uh, the, the, the guys who actually built the gimbal I showed you started this company. So you can see how innovators think, right? Oh, well, how, if I know where you are, I can do all sorts of fun stuff. So uh, they noticed that uh, ordering a roofer or a plumber or a maid to your house had a lot of problems. They said, we noticed the same problems that Travis Kalanick at Uber noticed when he took taxi rides. The reviews aren't very good online. They're not reliable because you know, competitors will uh, uh, write shit about your business and try to tear your business down. So the reviews here are written only by customers. You have to be a customer on the service. The prices are standardized, so you know what you're going to pay before you even click on the, on the thing to buy it. When you uh, order a plumber and it, it, it gives you a scheduling system, that's one of the secrets of the system. It tells you, hey, hey, your plumber is available next Tuesday afternoon. Well, on Tuesday afternoon, you know, the, the thing that pisses me off about Comcast, if they say they're going to come out and fix my cable modem, they say Tuesday afternoon sometime. And then I don't know, are they showing up at 2 or 5 or 8 p.m.? But with this, I see them coming toward my house, so I know exactly when they're going to come, right? And I, I, after they showed this to me, I was like, okay, that's cool. How many customers do you have? He goes, oh, let me show you. He pulls up the back end and shows me a map of San Diego, and it was completely red. Literally every house was a customer already. I'm like, your company is a year old. I don't even know your company's name. You aren't funded by a Silicon Valley startup. How did you get so many customers in San Diego? He goes, well, we built the best scheduling system for the plumber and the best money collection system for the plumber. We took friction away. And so we built this app and, and uh, everybody, the plumbers forced you to get onto it to negotiate with them for services. Think about the new world that's coming soon. I'm just gonna say, hey, I need a maid. How about Tuesday afternoon? And then it puts stuff on my schedule. Uh, shelf bucks. So retail is about to change pretty deeply. Um, if you go into a modern grocery store, they call them smart stores now, they're going to have a, 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 a box like this on a display. So you're going to go into the cookie aisle at a grocery store and they're going to have a display like this. And you're going to tap the display and get coupons and uh, all sorts of information about the cookies. The trick is there's nine little radios in there. If you have a modern phone, you don't even need to tap it. It knows you're in the cookie aisle. So I'm walking to the grocery store, and I'm walking down the cookie aisle, and it says, hey, you want some Oreo cookies, don't you? <laughs> They're down here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and you'll get 10 loyalty points if you take three packages. Oh, OK. <laughs> Marketing is about to change a lot of things. Think about the data systems that we're giving the world thanks to social media. Uh, Vintank is a company in Santa Rosa, California that studies any time you say something about wine. So if you say, I love Cabernet, he built a profile on you in real time. He's seeing uh, 2 million tweets a day about wine. 
and it's going up exponentially. We like to talk about wine and food, it turns out. Think about what one tweet tells the system. If you go to Penfield, Penfold's uh, winery, he knows you entered a geofence there. He knows that you checked in on Twitter because you left location services on on Twitter. And you, if you say, I just bought a case of Penfold's best Cabernet. Monty, what does that cost? $200 a bottle? Yeah, about 150 $150? So you just told me you make more than $100,000 a year. One tweet. And I bet you do a lot more than one tweet in your life. I've done 60,000 tweets. So it knows my credit score pretty accurately if it wanted to. So if you walk into my uh, winery in California, I don't have a winery, I'm just gonna make this up, but let, let's say I own um, Paradox Winery. They're about a $40 bottle of wine, drinkable wine. And you come in after uh, saying you bought a, a case of Cabernet at $150, I'm gonna take you straight to my reserve room because my little glass is gonna tell me that. We're building new kinds of smart stores that are gonna study you. This is a company called Shopperception that makes a system that's uh, watching dwell times in grocery stores, but they showed what it really could do. This is a PrimeSense 3D sensor. Apple bought the company, it's an Israeli company, and they put it over your head. And it's so accurate, uh, if you put one right here, it can tell how hard I'm touching this lectern, and I can do um, pressure sensitive writing with my finger. I saw that demo too at the same place. But it, here, it can tell your hand is going toward a box of Cheerios before your hand touches it. And the display over here in real time can say, hey, take three of those. <laughs> <laughs> and if I touch it, it, thank you for buying three of those, you know. And if I put it in my shopping cart, it can charge me automatically. I, I saw another uh, Y Combinator company that actually built four little uh, cheap video cameras and can see every kind of grocery item passed underneath it. So if you pass a box of Doritos underneath it, it just charges you automatically. So think about that. You're walking around with these glasses. They have a 3D sensor in them too. That's how the Magic Leap works, how it figured out where that table leg was so that things could run behind the table leg or in front of the table leg. And you're being watched by these 3D sensors as well. Google Glass is seen as a failure, but it's coming back. This is a Copen screen. It's sharper and brighter and half the size of the one that you've seen in the Google Glass. And this is already getting pretty old. So we're going to see glasses on customer service people at hotels, airlines, and other places that are going to tell them what's going on in the world. This guy started Epiphany Eyewear. He put a camera into the sunglasses. And they're pretty ugly, but they're getting less ugly. And Snapchat bought his company. So they're coming back, too, in the next decade. This is a company called ODG in San Francisco. They're right across the street from the ballpark. They've been making these things for 10 years for the military. They were a top secret R&D lab for DARPA. He made the night vision goggles for the military. But now he made the patents that sold to Microsoft for HoloLens. Once he did that, he started over and is bringing to market a new switchable AR and VR glass that right now is $3,000 and it's a little heavy, I think nine grams or something. But it's sharp and uh, it's coming. He figures he can reduce the price to less than $1,000 in quantities. And you know, once you get quantities going, then the prices start to come down exponentially. But he, I don't know where he goes with this. Uh, I assume he's gonna sell to some other company other than Magic Leap because once Google proves that there's a market, Apple and Amazon and 
other companies, Baidu, are going to need competitors. Well, Baidu is going to have Magic Leap. We're seeing new kinds of software being written to prepare for this new world. This is Blipar. Blipar is a visual search engine. You point it at things like this Lucky Charms and it augments, but it also builds a search engine. They demonstrated it at earlier this year to me with two real life dogs and it got the breed of the dog right. So they pointed at a Pomeranian and it said, here's the Pomeranian, here's everything about the dog that you're looking at. So I'm gonna be looking at these things with my Magic Leap glass and it's gonna tell me uh, uh, what kind of dog breed I'm looking at, <laughs> amongst other things, thousands of things, right? I could be doing a speech right now, it'd be telling me all sorts of stuff. We're seeing new kinds of vending machines. Uh, this is Cantaloupe Systems in San Francisco. His uh, family has owned a vending machine business for decades, and he said, this is stupid. Because uh, his drivers have to park, double park, probably get a ticket, walk up stairs to some office building, open the machine up, count how many Diet Cokes there are, go back downstairs, pick up the Diet Cokes, go upstairs, put them in the machine, and maybe repeat that process a few times. So he's paying people, you know, 20 bucks an hour to do that. They're unhappy because they have to uh, carry things up and down the stairs. Um, they make mistakes, it's not perfect. Uh, the machine might be empty because it was a hot day and all the coats sold in half an hour, so the machine's sitting there um, not used. So he uh, uh, bought a card from Jasper, an Internet of Things card. He takes out this thing and puts in a new thing, and he can take Apple Pay and Google Pay for the customers, the customers are happier, they don't have to find a dollar bill that goes in the stupid machine anymore. Um, but it tells the warehouse how many Cokes have sold today, or in real time, right? If a Coke sells, a uh, database knows it's sold. And so if it gets down to a certain level, somebody in the warehouse puts exactly what this machine needs into a bin, and the worker just grabs that bin and pulls it upstairs and fills the machine so they don't have to count, they don't have to be involved. They make one trip, they're saving uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars a quarter on gas and tickets and labor costs, it's crazy. This thing, you heard Brian Solis uh, talk about it, it's the Amazon Echo. My boss has bought $10,000 worth of stuff from Amazon over the last decade, and he has a database that he can look at and Amazon can look at of everything he's bought. What kind of, what brand of cups he buys, what brand of salt he likes, what brand of toilet paper he has, everything. So when he goes grocery shopping, he just talks to this thing. He says, Alexa, I need some salt. Would you like the morning salt that you bought last time? Yes. Alexa, I need some toilet paper. Would you like the Charmin brand you bought last time? Yes. Alexa, I need some meat. Uh, what kind of meat? <laughs> Lamb, beef, what? Yeah, and he tells it. And then he, when he gets that meat home, he says, Alexa, uh, set the burner uh, on my stove to five minutes. And it warns them when the five minutes is up. Alexa, what's the weather? Alexa, what's the stocks? Alexa, turn off the lights in the bedroom because he has new he lights in his house that are internet connected and they're connected to this thing. And on and on. We're getting a new kind of user interface, one that doesn't require you to look at the mobile phone. Um, actually, let's go back to that. I had dinner with uh, Adam Chire, who designed Siri. Siri was launched in my son's bedroom, which is a fun little fact. And he is building a new company called Viv. I'm about to see it, but he said, I'm gonna fix a lot of the problems that were built into Siri. And I said, okay, uh, Siri has a lot of edges to it. 
You know, if you ask it something that, that it actually knows, it's really magical, it's cool. But if you ask it something like, how many people are checked in in this room at, on Foursquare right now? Foursquare has an answer to that. It has an API to that, but Siri's not hooked up. So Siri takes you to Bing and gives you a stupid answer. And he's building an audio operating system for your watches, for your car, for your speakers, for everything, for this lectern. <laughs> and, and he's gonna uh, let software developers hook in audio responses into that so that you know, if you build a new data system, you can hook your data system into that and customers are gonna be able to talk to it. It's coming, it's coming in the next decade, it's coming in a big way. We're getting, this I saw in Dubai last week, uh, we're getting new smart stores that, um, you know, stores are being asked to uh, have more inventory turns per square uh, yard or square meter. And how do you do that with clothes? You know, if you can't afford a, a big store, well, put a smart screen in there. Some of these screens uh, know your clothing size as you walk up to the screen because they have a 3D sensor on them and they can figure out your clothing sizes plus or minus a quarter inch before you even start touching the screen. eBay showed me one of those and uh, Microsoft's uh, Startup Accelerator had a company that does that. And they're watching your sentiment. I saw a system uh, that uses a video camera and can know uh, your age plus or minus, uh, I think, three years and it's pretty accurate. Um, your uh, gender, uh, your happiness level. We'll talk more about that in a second. We're about to get devices in our homes that are gonna save our lives. The Apple Watch has saved one life I know of and uh, next version will have a lot more sensors turned on and it'll save more lives. But this thing is for people with senior parents um, who, who wanna live alone but you can't afford to hire somebody to watch them and make sure that they're okay. So you put a pill on their, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a sensor on their pill bottle, a sensor on their refrigerator door, and a sensor on their front door. And all it does is, is tell your mobile phone if, if your parents haven't been out of bed today. And then you call them up, and if they don't answer the phone, you go over there and check on them and go, what's going on? And this has saved four lives that I know of. We're gonna get internet into everything, IOT they call it. Uh, I saw uh, a, a basketball with sensors that knows if you made the shot. Uh, I've seen baby bottles, I've seen all sorts of other things. This isn't even a, a product that's on the market yet. It's a dog dish with a scale, a digital scale in it, and uh, communicates out to the internet how, many, how much food your dog's been eating so you know when your dog is hungry even before you get home. And you could, uh, you know, if you're, if you're uh, off somewhere, you can um, uh, fill it automatically with a robot. We have devices that we're going to be wearing on us. I've seen lots of clothing companies that have sensors in them. This is a little uh, Lumia device that sticks on your clothes. It tells you if you aren't sitting up straight, right? It's like a German mother. <laughs> I have one, I had one of those, so I know. I can just hear her voice in my head, stand, stand, sit up straight. Uh, we have sensors coming to our gardens to watch if we are uh, feeding our plants properly, watering them and putting enough nitrates in them. Uh, I talked to a, a, a vice president at 3M and he said the average farm uh, has zero sensors per acre right now. They have a few sensors on the tractors to figure out things like nitrate levels and stuff. But he said in the next 10 years, we're gonna have 50 sensors per acre. So we're gonna need to build new infrastructures and farmers are gonna have to go back to school to understand what the hell those sensors are telling them uh, so that they can optimize their profits and uh, fix their lands or whatnot to make uh, uh, farms more efficient. We're gonna uh, see devices like this in cities. This is in San Francisco. It, it checks if there's a car parked there, right? How does your self-driving car find a parking space for itself? Uh, it's going to use one of these. Um, and there's an app already in San Francisco that lets you see open parking spaces uh, thanks to these technologies. Let's talk about uh, the cool shit. <laughs> self-driving cars, right? 
Velodyne lasers. So um, does anybody have a Velodyne subwoofer? Anybody remember those? Yeah. Well, this is the same company. This guy, uh, David Hall, made uh, subwoofers <laughs> in the 1980s, and they were the best subwoofers out there. He told me he shipped that stuff all off to China, and they, make, they still make Velodyne subwoofers today. But he had an empty warehouse. He was like, I need to do something really complex in America with this empty warehouse. It's sort of some of the same things you're facing with uh, the Ford plants and, and other plants around here. Got an empty warehouse. What do you do with it? Well, he said, I probably can do a self-driving car. Tried that, lost to uh, Carnegie Mellon and Stanford, who, who were smarter at building the whole car and had more resources. But he figured out that, people, that these teams needed the sensor, and so he builds the LiDAR, the spinning thing on top of the Google car. I'm, I'm almost convinced that Google really doesn't care if it ever builds a self-driving car. It's learning about us thanks to this thing. Because it's driving around hundreds of thousands of miles a month, and the lasers are studying us on the streets. And their software engineers are building predictive models of what the hell are we about to do next? Partly to make the car work, because if you're in a busy street with a lot of people, you have to look at hundreds of people. Like in, in Shanghai, China, this thing has to work, right? So it's going to look at hundreds of people on the street, and it's going to predict what each one of those hundreds of people are going to do next. Are they going to jump in front of the car? Are they going to stay on the sidewalk? It's predicting that. It's predicting if there's a bicyclist next to the car, does it turn in front of the car or away from the car or keep going straight? Is the car over here going to keep going straight, or is he going to pull into my lane? It's predicting that. It's watching our behavior, and it's building very advanced machine learning systems to understand our gestures when we talk to the car. Because a cop who is at a red light that's not working and is telling you to do this, we know what that means, because we're humans, and we are good at our visual perception systems are good at figuring that out. Computers had to be, have to be taught that, right? But it's already uh, there. It knows what a cop means when he does this. We're going to build new kinds of smart cities. Uh, this is Dubai again. <coughs> they took me into a room with these big, huge screens. And they, uh, it's a new city. They have, uh, it, it, the whole thing was built in the last 15 years. So they have sensors in all sorts of places. And they have the 3D CAD drawings for every building and every object in there. If you go to Autodesk's uh, headquarters in San Francisco, they actually show you how you can fly into a building like this and go right to the elevator motor to see uh, the motor design, right? Because it's all in a CAD drawing somewhere. So we're going to sit around managing cities and turning on and off s traffic lights, and they're going to happen automatically or with a human assistance, where we're going to build APIs with this data to build new kinds of apps. How many people use Waze? W-A-Z-E. Come on. Anybody? You a few hands. It's really interesting you guys don't use it here. I think you're stupid for not using it. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. Because Telstra, uh, I don't know that it's Telstra that's doing it here, but it, in the United States it's Verizon. Verizon knows how fast your cell phone's moving. One mile an hour. And it reports that up to the service. And then Verizon, in real time, sells that data to Google. Waze is owned by Google, you know that. Right? And I saw an accident happen on a two-lane road right in front of me, and Waze turned red in 30 seconds. It knew that fast that the traffic had stopped. And in 90 seconds, there was somebody who took a picture of the accident. And in four minutes, the police arrived, and somebody wrote, the police just arrived. And in 10 minutes, there was somebody who got information from the police officer and said, this road's going to be closed for 45 more minutes. So just chill out while you're in traffic. It's going to be a while. So if you're a mile away, Waze is warning you, slow down, there's traffic ahead. Slow down, there's an accident ahead. Stop 
you know, get, get prepared. That's how the self-driving car is going to work. This is why Google bought this company. It tells you where cops are. It's told me there's a ladder in the road up ahead. Look for it. And it, sure enough, there was a ladder in the road. Uh, it tells me when roads are closed because people are routing around closures or if there's construction on the road. And it, it saves me hours every week by routing me around traffic in real time because it knows where the traffic is because thanks to the cell phone companies, they see that in real time. And this is an Israeli company and they're pretty smart about routing you around. Once in a while, it'll take you someplace weird and you're like, I don't know. But uh, eight or nine times out of 10, it'll save you time if you pay attention to it. We're seeing new kinds of wearables thanks to our little microcomputers. Uh, this is Chase Jarvis, famous photographer, but he's wearing the Oakley Airwave ski goggle, and inside there's a Recon Instruments computer. Uh, Intel bought this company. It shows you how, uh, where on the mountain you are, so you see a little map of the mountain when you use it, and um, how fast you're going, um, where your kids are, because they have an Android or an iPhone app in their pocket. You can chat with your kids. Um, what else did it show you? Oh, yeah. Hang time of your last jump. In my case, not on purpose. <laughs> but it shows you that. <laughs> and they sold out the first year, so this is a big business now, putting little devices and wearables. Manufacturing is about to radically change. When you visit the manufacturing line of the future at Jabel, um, they have robots and they have a line that does everything pretty much automatically. There's like one worker at the beginning to make sure the machine is stopped and one worker at the end to make sure that they get packed properly. It's the problem for manufacturing based economies, right? If somebody's building those robots, <laughs> there's a lot of jobs and robots all of a sudden. And there's a new kind of workstation, even if you're a human. This thing teaches you how to work in real time. It has a sensor overhead, a projector overhead, and another sensor, and it teaches you put part A onto the motherboard, and if you do it wrong, it'll warn you. And if you do it too slow, your boss gets warned. So <laughs> it's a new Toyota manufacturing system work workstation of the future. We're seeing new kinds of entertainment coming. This guy runs uh, innovation at the Golden State Warriors uh, championship basketball team back where I live. And he told me in China, there's hundreds of thousands of people who are buying the Warriors jerseys. There's a lot of fans over in China and other places. But they can't come to the game because it costs you know, too much to fly to a Warriors game. So they're going to put 360 cameras on the court side and record this stuff in virtual reality and pipe it to China, and you're going to pay 10 bucks a game to watch it in 360 on uh, China. If you go to, I was at the Indy Race, that's where I shot this picture, uh, and uh, Verizon is doing uh, activations. You know, they have a nice VIP tent there, and they're building new kinds of experiences so you can experience what it's like to be in a Formula One or an indie car race, uh, thanks to virtual reality. It's pretty cool. Marketers are starting to use this and getting a lot of lines around their booths when they do new things. This is my friend Andy. Uh, he built one, was one of the 12 people who built the iPhone. And let's talk about Oculus Rift. How many people have tested, uh, tried an Oculus Rift? A few hands. So they took me, I, I visited them a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, and they took me into a room, put it on me, and said, hang out here, I'll be in, in the virtual world to join you in a second. And this is what I saw when they turned it on. I saw my friend across the table in real time, and I can bounce balls on my paddles, I can shoot, uh, balls or slingshots. I can light fireworks with a thing that looks like a real f flame and it behaves like a real firework. Uh, you can shoot each other. You can break things. You can play with things on, on the table. You can have a lot of fun. 
I didn't want to leave. And this could happen over the internet, so we can do stuff like this. And this is a prototype. I can't even imagine what Electronic Arts is working on with this kind of technology to make new kinds of video games and stuff like that. New kinds of cameras are coming. Uh, that's my camera on the, on the right. It's six GoPros and a little ball that was 3D printed by a guy. Takes a lot of stitching and it's a pain in the ass. Overheats and cuts off. So there's uh, people who are building uh, Spira cams and jaunt cameras. This jaunt camera is pretty interesting. There's a competitor called NextVR. Has 18 lenses around it. And the CEO was on my stage uh, a couple weeks ago, and I said, you're not just capturing visual information, are you? He goes, that's very astute. Because I'm putting all the visual information up into the cloud, and then I'm building a 3D model of the room in real time. So you think about that Oculus, or the, the Magic Leap, he's gonna be able to know the 3D model of this room in real time, and I'm going to be able to put stuff on top of the real world with all sorts of new fancy cameras. And he can fly you around um, virtually, because once he has this image, um, I can virtually move the camera around without moving the camera, I mean, the real camera. The real camera will just sit here, but I can uh, move my camera so I can pan around, I can move around. So there's a lot of stuff coming. They, these guys are uh, not even selling the cameras. They're going to come out and film your music festival or your movie and uh, are going to capture a new way. I went to, the, like I said, I went to 20th Century Fox and met with Ted Chilowitz, and he showed me some new movies that they're working on. One had uh, Reese Witherspoon in, in virtual reality, and he made me watch the movie twice because it wasn't the same movie depending on where you were looking. The, the headset knows where you're looking. So he said, just stare at this rock and watch the movie, okay? Now, watch it how you would want to watch it. Well, I wanted to watch where the sound was coming from. So, so Reese Witherspoon had a backpack on and she marched into the picture. And I was watching her sit there and do stuff. And then he said, now look back at that rock. And I looked back, and there's a new actress there that wasn't there before. He said, we're going to be able to change movies into not linear things, but movies that are going to react to our moving around. And soon we're going to be able to put things into that table. I saw another Magic Leap picture, just the video today, where a whale jumps out of a table. Pretty crazy. <laughs> Innovation continues. I just saw this uh, a week ago. The guy came up to me after my talk and said, I have something to show you. It's not even out yet. It doesn't even have a name yet. It's a little device you put on your clothes. And it records everything you say for two days on one battery charge. And he says, when I listen to your, when my device listens to your voice, it is going to know the context or some context. And he's trying to grab more context. He's going to uh, put your voice into a bin if you're angry. Because he can hear that, his uh, system can tell when you're angry. So if you yell at your wife, it's going to put that in the angry bin, and then you can go back and listen to that part of the conversation and maybe work with your therapist on <laughs> a little uh, personality problem you might have, right? <laughs> but if you're sitting with your family, it'll put the voice into the family. If you're sitting in a movie theater, it'll put that a voice into an entertainment thing. If you go going to school and you're in class, it'll put it into your education thing. And if you tap it, it'll mark it with more uh, metadata so that you will know that's a real note that you want to really catch later on and listen to again. So you can keep putting ideas into it. Uh, Brian Solis backstage was just constantly filling in a notebook with ideas, right? Well, now he could just be talking to him and, and talking to himself, <laughs> and, and he'll have everything backed up in his notebook. <laughs> and he walks up to me and goes, 
how do I uh, convince people this is okay? <laughs> how do I convince people that uh, they should use this and it's okay to record everybody's voice when it's, not a, it's, not, it's against the law in some states in America to record somebody else's voice without their permission. So you gotta build a new kind of social contract, a new kind of brand, a new kind of thing, right? Marketing problem for him. He's already built the technology, the technology works. Right? It's coming. We're gonna be able to talk to things, see things, experience things in new ways that don't require us to look at our mobile phone. And that's my talk, and uh, I hope I freaked you out. How many people here are freaked out by this new world? <laughs> yeah, a third of the hands. That's where innovation comes from, getting people freaked out, you know? So um, good luck with uh, remaking your uh, city into an innovation zone where uh, you, you bring things to the world that freak people out, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Robert Scoble. Yeah. So we've got time for questions. Yeah. You get to stick around? Yeah. Get a Q&A? We, we can do a little Q&A. Uh, should we ask Alexa some questions or, or do yeah, you reckon? Yeah, you know. The, the, the uh, Echo hasn't been released in Australia yet. No. But uh, it's on the way, I'm told. Yeah. It's on the way. Yeah. So uh, who's going to kick us off with uh, questions from the floor? Uh, I don't have any of the digital glasses. I wore Google Glass for a year and they were pretty cool some of the time. They were an unfinished product. And they had, a lot of people blamed uh, the wrong thing. And they blamed the camera on their failure. But I was sitting at, inside a music festival at Coachella. And everybody was recording the thing, right? Everybody's holding up their iPhone and their GoPro cameras. I was in the middle of the Sahara tent. And two people in front of me said, I got to get away from the guy with the Google Glass. I wasn't even wearing it because I didn't want to wear it at a, a music festival. And sure enough, I turned around and two people were using Google Glass. So why, uh, these people were freaked out by it. They didn't care about the recording. It just freaked them out. <laughs> and it turns out by talking to them, it, it puts a screen between us. Yes. And that messes with our social contract, right? If I pull out my phone right now and I start <laughs> dealing with my phone, you can say, Scoble, isn't uh, this talk more important than looking at Facebook or you know, whatever I'm doing on the phone? And you can see the screen. So it makes you feel pretty calm about that, right? Mm -hmm. And you can renegotiate the social contract. But if I'm doing the exact same thing in a glass where you can't see what I'm doing, it really freaks, freaks you out. It freaks me out uh, to be on the recipient side, and I know what it's doing, right? Well, wait until it's all implanted and, and you can't see it. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming very but soon. It's coming where we're all going to have it. And it's going to be interactive. So, and that's when I think it, the culture will shift. Because if we all have this glass on and we're all playing a new kind of game on the table, we're all cool with it because it's, we all can see again what each other is doing. You know, like that video of Oculus Rift. I could see what the other guy was doing in this virtual world. So I felt very calm there, even though I had a weird ass thing on my face and he had a weird ass thing on his face, right? But it's getting smaller. The technology is oh, yeah. getting smaller every day. Every, so. every day, yeah. Wonderful, other Thanks questions? All the, uh, all the millions of people who are buying smartphones today are helping the R&D industry. Yeah. We've got a question from Amir. Yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, uh, the, mic, the mic's here, the mic's on the way, Grab just the so everyone can else can hear. Yeah, so I'm Amir from ICT Geelong. And my question is, we are absolutely freaked out by the power of innovation. Now, what we can do as a city, not only to embrace innovation, but to become leaders in this space, what's next? Yeah, I was thinking about that, you know. If we had this meeting 20 years ago, and somebody would have said, you know what, in our, in our future, we're gonna have a jobs problem. So uh, we're gonna have a festival in the middle of desert and we're going to take the best art our artists can create, and we're going to take it to that festival in the desert, and we're going to burn it. Burning man. And we're, and we're going to have, think it's the coolest thing ever. How, how many people went to Burning Man? 60,000 people 60, this year, 000. right? Dust and bugs is all I heard about it. And so where I'm thinking, because we're going to have a deep jobs problem in the world, right? Self-driving cars are going to do away with a lot of jobs. Trauma surgeons are going to lose jobs. Highway patrolmen are going to lose jobs. 
uh, uh, auto body shops are going to lose jobs. Uh, car manufacturers are going to lose jobs because you're not going to need a car for every human. You're going to need a car for every 20 humans, right? Because that car is going to be shared amongst us and not sit in a damn parking lot like all of our cars are sitting over there right now. So what do we do? I think we create art. Create art. Movies. Paintbrushes. Virtual reality. Photoshop. Well, those are some of the skills you're going to need to create art, but I think you're going to need uh, augmented reality, uh, machine learning, vision learning systems. The guys who are building these companies now are creating devices that are going to redefine what art is. Mm. And we're going to buy those devices because they're fun. They don't do all that much. All right, they might help us uh, make things or find our way, but they're going to create new forms of art for us. Well, music has been transformed, isn't it? I mean, we've gone from an instrument uh, com composition. Absolutely. You go to MIT Media Lab, they have a whole room of futuristic instruments where they're playing with new kinds of sounds. And you uh, study the bleeding edge artists like Skrillex. Uh, he's creating sound on computer, right? Mm. I, it's funny, I, I was on, invited to be on a panel at a music and technology conference about EDM. I'm like, what do I know about EDM? But I went to this Coachella festival for the last four years, and I, me and another guy had these long ass lenses, 600 millimeter lenses. And so I would watch old people go up to the Sahara tent, which is where all the EDM music, and electronic music yeah. was, before it really got big. Now it's big, right? But and they would drop their kids off into the Sahara tent, and then they would leave. And then I would watch the kids, and they're having a great time. <laughs> they're part, full on partying, right? And I would grab, I would eventually get brave enough to go and grab the old people. And I asked them, why aren't you going in? This is the coolest music. And they give me some answers, six answers. They're not playing instruments. Because when we grew up, we listened to The Who or Led Zeppelin or, uh, you know... Uh, Paul Kelly dance, right? You know, whatever, right? They played uh, instruments, yes. you know, horns or guitars. Slash told me that. He goes, these people don't play instruments. I don't get it. Unbelievable. My dad uh, told me about one. There's no melody to the music, right? It's boom, boom, boom. My wife hates EDM because she says it's just boom, boom, boom music, right? But to me, I hear the musical uh, innovation that's going on. I, I enjoy it. Um, lighting is different. When we grew up going to concerts, the lights uh, were incandescent lights like these, and they turn on and off slowly, and they're, uh, they don't cause epilepsies. <laughs> the new lights are all LED lights, and they have grids of them at Skrillex concerts, and they just blast your mind. Your mind just gets shredded. We'll have a look at this screen. Yeah, yeah this is beautiful. Screen. Screen. Yeah, they have 50 of these screens all around you, right? You know, and it's just a, a very uh, intense experience. And on and on. So uh, no story to music, right? Old people like stories. They like to listen to them. Kelvin know. Harris has got a few stories. I think they're pretty uh, short stories. but Very short, but, you know, that's what the kids like. It's, it's a Facebook world now, right? you got to write everything to fit in a tweet. 140 <laughs> characters. Even a story. 140 <laughs> characters. Speaking of tweets, have we got any questions through uh, social media? Nothing coming through at the moment, but uh, a couple more minutes for questions in the room. Yeah. Anybody else? Leighton Wells, down the front. So how is your network going to keep up with this uh, new world, man? How's your network going to keep up with this? Because I'm going to have uh, a self-driving car. Not Apple's, putting me on the spot at all. A Apple's going to make a car with screens all around me. You know, Bert Rutan, who makes all these planes, he made the plane that flew around the world. He, he, he mouthed off at a, at a uh, conference. He says, I want to uh, have a car without any windows, and I want to have sex with a supermodel in my car as it's driving around town. So if I uh, want to... Just trying to work out what that's got to do with the network, but anyway. <laughs> that's a lot of bits to be pouring at my screens all over me. Well, like I, can tell you, I can tell you one thing uh, Australia leads, leads the world on, that is mobile network technology. You've been using our 4G network here the yeah, last few days. Yeah, it's fast. Yeah, it's yeah. got Half Moon Bay covered and Verizon. Yeah. Yeah, okay, well, yeah. <laughs> let's leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. 5G's coming though, huh? 5G's coming. I can all tell right, you I've seen it, I've used it. 600 megabits uh, per second, so... Uh, faster than a lot of fixed connections, so. Very cool. Leighton. Uh, yes, uh, uh, you were in the, uh, uh, speaking at the Telstra Digital Summit a couple yeah. of days ago, and, uh, and now you're down here, which is fantastic. And uh, so the last couple of days, or the last couple of talks that you've done, what, uh, in interacting with 
uh, 10 days and speaking to people, what have you seen that's sparked your interest? Um, every time I come to Australia, I see new kinds of companies. The sporting company was really interesting. I saw, last time I was here, I saw Canva, uh, started by Melanie Perkins. Yeah. She just got $15 million a couple of weeks ago, so her company's doing really well. I saw uh, Jody Fox on another trip who built Shoes of Prey. Yeah, it's a wonderful And it's building custom shoes, millions of different versions of shoes that you can customize online. And she's doing real well. Every company's doing real well. Technology-backed companies, right? Because you can't sell millions of copy, different versions of shoes without some technology to uh, deliver that, right? And there's a lot of technology on our factory floors and uh, in our databases to present different kinds, you know, different kinds of leathers, different kinds of fabrics, different kinds of feathers, you know, all sorts of fun stuff. She makes a lot of shoes for uh, music uh, stars. So. Wonderful. Now, you're going to join us uh, on the panel uh, this afternoon, but we've got to get you to do uh, a lucky business card draw. Okay. I'll be one second. All right. Any other questions? I don't want to... Yeah, oh. a Andrew. Hey, Rob. Hey, man. Hey, what's up, man? <laughs> Not too much, buddy. Hey, you posted yesterday on Facebook about um, Uber putting up a, sorry, not Uber, the taxi industry, basically putting a sign up at Sydney Airport that, yeah. you know, um, Uber and these sorts of things, it's the same as hitchhiking, it's dangerous. I mean, that's a real pushback on, you know, innovation, adoption, and so yeah. forth. Are we going to see this in other industries as well? You mentioned before all these industries that are going to be, you know, yeah. dying or having to change. I mean, it's going to be a massive battle, right? People or are they going to adopt? People don't like to lose their jobs. People don't like change. When I talk about self-driving cars with normal people, they're like, I like to drive. You know, what are you talking about? Oh, I like to drive. It's part of being American and, and back home. It's, and I understand where that comes from because it comes from our media and uh, it's part of freedom to drive, right? BMW has these conversations with me. We, we were on a boat talking about this with BMW. Their whole company line is uh, the ultimate driving machine, right? So how do you make a self-driving car for BMW? They're the ultimate them. passenger machine. No. The ultimate, you think you're driving machine. <laughs> Autopilot. Autopilot. Because what did the Eagle computer do, uh, CEO do in the 1980s the day he went public? He bought a Ferrari and wrapped it around a tree. Killed himself, right? because he couldn't handle the car. The car had too many horsepower for somebody who doesn't understand what to do with that, right? It breaks the tires free. Elon Musk, when he took me in his first Tesla, said my car will never do that because I have a sensor on the tires watching if it's breaking free of traction and it uh, slows the engine down because these electronic engines could, you know, spin rubber, no problem. They have a lot of torque. And he's making sure your car doesn't do that. So the new self-driving car, if you try to pull into a lane with a truck in it, it doesn't let you do that, right? So it's the ultimate driving machine. It is the ultimate driving machine. That won't let you kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I, at Stanford University, they're, they're working on a new program to make a self-driving car faster than any race car driver. And they're pretty close to it. They've already beat a lot of the race cars because um, they can push tires to the edge of traction with these, with, with these robots, with these sensors. So you're going to push a button on your screen in your BMW and you're going to say, I want to be Danica Patrick today. Awesome. <laughs> and I might even just go drive like Danica Patrick would drive <laughs> and let the car drive, right? But it would get you on the ultimate thrill ride, maybe get the car sideways. They did that to journalists at CES. They got the car sideways. And it's Leighton, have you organized that out the front for us? It's automatic <laughs> driving, right? And it doesn't kill you. So it's the ultimate self-driving uh, driving machine that uh, won't kill you, right? Absolutely awesome. So, well, why don't you uh, grab one of these uh, business cards out?